Party. It is pretty hot in here. I was sweating like Gavin Newsom watching Total Recall. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Come on, folks. You know, uh, I was watching uh, the, the Capitol Hill's uh, riot was crazy, wasn't it, Darren? Yeah, it was Capitol it was Hill cuckoo. riot. Yeah. When I first turned on the news, I thought they were raiding a Jake Paul after party. <laughs> That's right. You know, a lot of people are saying they think that they faked the Mars landing. Well, come on. You got to admit, it does look like Palmdale. <laughs> I swear I saw a meth lab. Uh, hey, the economy is so bad, Mike Lindell is now selling your pillow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the my pillow guy, you know, he just broke up with his girlfriend. Yeah, apparently it, it didn't end well. They wound up in a big pillow fight. <laughs> Everybody listen to Derek Carter. Yeah. We all know he's the party starter. Uh, so if you want to listen to a podcast for free, yeah. listen to a pocket party. Pocket party. Uh, pocket party. They're wrong. All right, we are recording. We're going to call Fraser Smith, the great radio legend, comedian Fraser Smith. He's a regular on the Pocket Party podcast. This guy is gold. Hello? Hello, Frazier. You're on the air. Uh, what did I win? <laughs> you get to be in the Pocket Party Podcast. <laughs> oh, man, I was hoping for a boat. <laughs> <Dang>. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny when you try to work clean, because I just thought of a dirty joke right there, and I didn't say it. But I'm going to say it anyways. I'll say it for the podcast. Because when you said boat, I thought of Popeye, and I thought, boats are full of semen. <laughs> Which is so, I don't know why I've been on a Popeye rant lately. I, I, I think I was on the phone with a friend, and I did a Popeye impression. He goes, you do that really good. And I'm like, yeah, but I, and then I realized, you know what, maybe I could bring it back. Maybe because this whole like Pepe Le Pew, everything's old school, is you're, you know, they're getting canceled. And I was talking about Popeye with him, and I go, you know, we were like, Popeye, he might have been the first vegan, you know? Like, he loved the, I like spinach, I got a strong Mediterranean diet. I loves me olive oil. <sighs> well, you know, you just mentioned, I'm really glad they finally canceled that uh, slimy, uh, sexual harassing skunk. I'm talking about Harvey Weinstein. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. Chokes over here. Applause. Yeah, they yeah. love that one. Yeah, they love that one. Can you hear that applause? I don't know. Can you hear that? Yeah, just barely. Oh, kind of cool. like when I'm actually on stage. I can barely you hear can them barely. applauding. Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. usually they're not applauding. So. Yeah. yeah, like the old golf clap, right? When they're like, Yeah, that's what I get. For it's, me, that's a standing O. It's just, hey, it's weird when you do comedy in a parking lot. I've been doing those where the people are in their vehicles and, uh, dude, I got to tell you a story. Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel, if, if anybody's listening, uh, by the time you hear this, I think they'll be doing it back poolside or possibly in the theater eventually. But we've been, we've done about four shows in the parking lot where people are in their cars. And I don't know, man, it's, uh, you know, when you're, when you're a stand up like, like my style, we like to improvise a little bit. So I've figured out if I can beatbox and then have them honk their horns on beat. It actually goes over really well, and it gets them involved, you know? Yeah, that's a good idea. Like I go, hey, whenever I put my hand out, you guys hit the horn. So I go, beep, 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 beep. And then guess what? I get off stage, and then about a half hour later, they were like, the manager comes over, and he goes, the promoter comes over, and he goes, yeah, they, the neighbors are complaining about all the horn honking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, well you know you can't win <laughs> yeah so so they weren't allowed to honk their horns after like 9 p.m oh, and then man, what's so I, wrong with those i was like just flash neighbors. your lights i know and, and i realized and I, I i might throw a joke in there somewhere about maybe this is uh maybe you know i don't know maybe something about the idea of uh you know comedians that only perform in parking lots in front of cars we're the real honkies <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's kind of true in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you have you ever done comedy in front of people in their cars? I I haven't, but I know that uh, honks as good as a laugh these days. Exactly. 
I know. You're going to a flock of geese will fly past you and get flashbacks. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, but it's interesting that they're doing that and I'm um, glad that, you know, that, that, uh, people still get to perform during this whole thing. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's, it's, it's different. It's, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, it's funny because you just see how the different comedians adapt. Like, you know, Jeff Ross is on stage and he's, he was, uh, he's just so relaxed up there and he's like, he's making fun of people's cars, making fun of people's cars. Oh, I had a good one. I said a very diverse audience. we got Toyota, Honda, Lexus, <laughs> <laughs> you know the uh it's uh yeah it's it's interesting like just seeing how you know comedians adapt like i've done some zoom shows and the first one i did i didn't like it at all and then and then you know i've done about seven now and and they get better like i, I realize like oh i can hold up a funny photo because it's on camera and everyone can see the details of the photo or i can you know like do a little bit more like a couple props here and there yeah sure yeah, that's got to, you know, uh, kind of have to uh, work with whatever the medium is, right? Yeah, you know, that's what I wanted to ask you. Um, when did you start stand-up in Los Angeles? Well, uh, I was working with Tom Joyner, and uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I got it. Since you brought Tom Joyner's name up. Okay, so you were on a couple of episodes ago, and we were talking about a morning DJ, very famous Tom Joyner. He would, before technology got to where it is now, I guess his big thing is he would fly on Southwest airlines. He would do the morning show in Dallas, Texas, and then get on a, a flight and do, was it the, the drive home in Chicago? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I think it was Chicago. He, he but he fly back and forth every day. And now of course you don't have to do that. Uh, he would, he wouldn't have any flyer, uh, frequent flyer miles today. Uh, but yeah, he had to fly all over the place and do uh, two cities, do the morning show in one city and the afternoon uh, show in another city. Yeah, now you can do it all. You could do it from your home right now. Like I'm literally yeah. In, in, yeah. I'm literally on a farm, like away from LA, over the phone. Like I don't have to fly anywhere, or even take a train or, or nothing. I'm just like, hey, Fraser, are you available? <laughs> well, that's the thing. And see, I'm in Fresno right now. <laughs> hey, we're both up here. We should just meet somewhere. Oh, you're in Fresno too. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. By the way, when I drove over Fraser Park the first time, I thought for some reason it was so weird because I was listening to the radio and you were on and it was just like, wow, Fraser Smith. And I'm seeing the sign Fraser Park. It was just weird to me. Well, you know what? I always claimed that park is my own. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> you know, I got the sign. Why not? Okay. I always wanted to steal that sign. Oh yeah, and put it like have your own parking space. You know, this is this, yeah. this is Fraser's Park. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so when you were on the show, we talked a little bit about Tom Joyner, and then just like right now, we got a little bit sidetracked. And I had this this guy message me. He's like, I wanted to hear Fraser Smith's Tom Joyner story. What happened? So do you, do you have any idea? Like, tell tell us everything you know about Tom Joyner. Well, uh, that's it. I don't have a Tom Joyner story. Sorry to let that listener down. Um, I don't think I have a time. I, I, I did a weekly bit on his show. I was like his agent. Luke oh. Warm was oh. my name. Luke Warm. And I was the agent, and I always had stupid gigs for him, and I would go in and record that. I never actually saw Tom. I don't know that I've ever actually met Tom. He's a big time DJ, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I really I have no I have no story on him. Although we've kept that poor listener hanging for three weeks, so that was good. It's like, what's the story? Well, I've never met him. Uh, he was always flying. <laughs> no just, story. Yeah, was, well, I'm glad you hung out. Exactly. Thanks for tuning in. I'll tweet yeah. this guy and let him know. I'll be like, hey, here's the story. What do you do? <laughs> you got to listen <laughs> <laughs> on the edge yeah. of your airplane seat, just like Tom Joyner. Yeah. So you're asking me about when I started uh, in L.A. I think it was in uh, 1979. Uh, Jamie Masada, the owner of the Laugh Factory, was uh, on my radio show as a sidekick. And uh, he was a character called Buddy Buddy, because that was really the only two words he knew in English. Buddy, 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 let me tell you, buddy, I make it happen, buddy, we get it going, buddy. And uh, just a crazy foreign guy, a kind of a nefarious foreigner. And we weren't really making fun of foreigners so much as just he was just a cartoonish voice on the show. And it became very popular later. Uh, you know, it was weird because that was the time of the uh, 
Iranian hostage crisis, and uh, Jamie is Iranian, but for some reason, the American audience loved this character, and it was actually kind of a bonding thing, I thought. That's cool. It kind of took, yeah, it kind of took some of the, the anger out of the whole scenario, because everybody loved this guy. So Jamie would come on my show in the morning, and and uh, he was going to open a club, and he didn't even have the club open yet. Uh, he had... Uh, borrowed some money and was going to open uh, a little tiny club because it was only half the size of what uh, the Laugh Factory is now. It's right on the corner there of Laurel and Sunset. And uh, at that time, that was kind of a weird end of the strip, you know. You'd actually, in those days, you'd see prostitutes out front and drug dealers, and it was kind of a... And then across the street was the famous Schwab's uh, Pharmacy, which was, of course, they had, the, you know, all the stars would hang out there. And uh, all the big stars would hang out at Schwab's for years. And so Jamie, anyway, opened this club. And I had never really done stand-up comedy before. But I thought, you know, he kept bugging me. Thres, come down. Do, do a show, buddy. We get it going. So I would go down there and host the shows. And I would do some of my jokes from the radio. And, um, you know, he couldn't really get a very big crowd in there at first because there was just so the club was new, and all the top comics were, of course, going down the street to the comedy store, which is like a mile down the street. So uh, he really didn't. And so I would go out there with no material and just wing it. And uh, that's how I really got started in L.A. was uh, was working at the Laugh Factory when it was the tiny little Laugh Factory. Wow. And do, do you remember that Schwab's across the street? Like, I've heard so much about it. Like, people got discovered there. People would hang out there, like the different actors and actresses. Yeah, all the big actresses uh, and, and actors would hang there from a certain era. You know, that was kind of the, you know, the era of um, the of the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was funny because I was reading a story about Lenny Bruce uh, got into a fight out in front of Schwab's and was thrown through the window. <laughs> wow. And and it's great yeah. because you can picture it. You're like, I know where that is. Is it where, where um, I don't even know if Virgin Records is there anymore, but is it, it's across the street where that Virgin Records is or that? Yeah, exactly. Where that little mall is now. Like that with, crunch with and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's where crunch is right now. And, um, and it, it was, and then there was apparently there was a place called Gogi's, which was right next door, which was like a, a famous breakfast place where the stars would hang out and all the big stars would go there. And uh, the big stars kind of had a, like Lucille Ball and, and all, you know, they could just walk behind the counter and make their own malted or, or, or milkshake or whatever. Wow. And uh, yeah. And, and it was kind of like a home away from home for the actors. They could all hang there. Uh, I, I think, I think some of the actors and singers lived behind the laugh factory, right on Laurel, like a uh, James Darren or, or something, Bobby Darren. Possibly, yeah, in those somebody, apartments there. Yeah, I knew it was somebody uh, named Darren. Like the, I, I saw a photo, and I was like, I recognize that. And it said Laurel, and I was like, wow. So that maybe that makes sense. They they go to Schwab's and they maybe live in the neighborhood and walk around. And do you remember the old uh, comedy team Laurel and Darren? <laughs> no, <laughs> Laurel and Hardy. When I was a kid, I didn't even give them the respect of their names. I didn't even know I was like seven. I was like, I like those guys, fatty and skinny. <laughs> Like I didn't yeah, even, I didn't funny. even. I didn't even know who they were. Like, I mean, I didn't know that until I got a little older. That I'm like, oh, Laurel and Hardy. You know. Yeah, my little my nephews when they were young, they were all into Laurel and Hardy, and they really didn't know who they were either. But they thought they were funny. Um, anyway, Laugh Factory uh, started. You know, it was around '79, and um, Jamie had this little club, and it was. Um, you know, not none of the big comics would go there uh, at that time. And so it was just kind of us up and comers and beginners um, doing stuff. And then slowly but surely, some of the bigger name comics would come down there to try out material before they you know, played at a bigger club. And you know, Richard Pryor even showed up one time with Paul Mooney. And uh, and so Pryor was there and and uh, Dice would come down there and work on stuff and and uh, Louis Anderson and you know, that, some of the big that was a big comics. deal. I, I, I could see like as, like imagine being in Jamie's shoes, like you're opening this thing, you're hoping and then finally you start getting like big names, like really big names. That must have been just a huge like feeling well, for you guys. It was weird, <laughs> you know, walking to this place that held about 50 people and there's Dice on stage, you know. <laughs> What's up, guys? How you like the show so far? Pretty good, right? kind of weird that I'm out here in the country with the chair next to me but anyways if you like this show and you want to help out 
go to Cameo. I do birthday shout outs, anniversary shout outs, or if you just want to do a donation, go to DarrenCarter.com, PayPal, or Venmo at Darren Carter Comic. Now let's get back to the show. Uh, <laughs> doing his nursery rhymes, but um, yeah, it was a, really a cool experience. Uh, I, you know, I had to learn under fire because I really didn't know anything about doing stand-up comedy, but I would just take my jokes from the radio that week and do those on stage. And I was mostly hosting, which is basically what I still do. And, uh, you know, it became kind of a, a you know, fun little club. Uh, but then what really uh, propelled that forward was um, he got a deal with Fox. First of all, he bought the Chinese restaurant next door. They had a Chinese restaurant that was really famous called Ah Fong's. And Ah Fong's wasn't much to look at inside, but it had really good food. So all the stars would go there. And that was back during the days of the limos. So everybody would, all day long limos would be pulling up uh, out front and uh, you know, the star would stay in the limo and the driver would run in and get the food. And um, one day I remember Sammy Davis Jr. Pulled up oh. in his limo and he jumped out and he ran on stage. He goes, Hey man, I always wanted to try a few jokes here. And he ran. On stage. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> that was a bad Sammy impression. But anyway, he got, hey, man, and, do you remember, do you remember, man. do you have any idea what jokes he told? No, he told a really long, dirty joke, I remember, and there's like three people in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they were blown away. They were like, Sammy Davis Jr.? They couldn't believe it. You know, some couple from the Midwest, and it, it made their, and he took a picture with him. That must have made their vacation. Um, and at the so end, anyway, he's like, well, my goo, my Moogoo guy pan is ready, babe. I've got to go grab some <laughs> orange chicken. Oh, and I mean that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and so then Jamie bought the uh, when Mr. Afong died. Uh, Jamie bought the uh, the restaurant. So then I remember the us comics went down there with sledgehammers one night and knocked the wall down in between the uh, the two places. And Jamie's and then, like, buddy, buddy, wrong wall, buddy, wrong wall, buddy. <laughs> buddy, you knocked wall. Well, that was another thing that happened there. Uh -oh. <laughs> a car, an older guy was driving at night, late at night, and he got his. He was like older, and he got his foot stuck on the accelerator, and it went up over the curb and ran into the side of the laugh factory. Mm. And and Jamie didn't have enough money to fix it at that time, so we were, you just put up this uh, you know this plexiglass and this and this uh, police tape, and we, we you could look into the club from the sidewalk. You know, we would <laughs> oh, do so, the you, shows. so you were playing for cars even before the pandemic. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you know, like... we started that whole thing, and not only that, but it kind of looked like the Hard Rock Cafe that night with the car sticking <laughs> oh, out of hilarious. the end. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> And then the cops, I remember, were, were teasing Jamie that night. They were like, is this preferred parking, Jamie? Is this parking right <laughs> in the club? Uh, so we knocked the, the wall down, and then, uh, you know, then he got a deal with Fox. Fox decided to do Comic Strip Live there. And uh, that was a show that ran for about seven years, uh, had all the comics on it, and uh, from the East Coast, too. All the big East Coast comics did the show. Um it was a lot of fun and that kind of, they can remodel the place and it really put Jamie on the map. So that's where I started doing stand up. Wow. That's crazy. You know, um, <clears throat> so you started before you, I mean, you knew Jamie before you were even a, a comedian and, and that's great. Yeah. Like, like you yeah. guys grew, like you kind of grew together. Like you grew as a comic and as a entertainer and a performer. And, and, and then he grew as a club owner and, and, with you know his different projects and how the club has expanded to various cities that's pretty amazing man like you guys well i'm pretty proud of him because you know he was really the american dream he came to america I, you know uh paul rodriguez has a funny joke he says um uh his, his joke is jamie came to america with only a couple million dollars in his pocket uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he only came to this country with only uh, it's American journey, only only two million dollars. I mean, he he started from the top and got higher. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but he really did. You know, he really didn't have any money at all, and he got here and somehow made a success out of himself. He really had that. Yeah. By, by the way, I don't know why I thought of that right now. I got to tell you a quick Paul Rodriguez joke. Uh, there's a comedian that's not very good looking, and he made fun of him one time, like he roasted him. He goes, one more time, keep it going for Joey. He's the winner of a pet lookalike contest. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, and by the way, I want to do a shout out to Paul because he's uh, just uh, uh, having heart surgery. He's just gotten over it and he's 
Doing fine. So, so uh, yes, yes, quadruple bypass. Yeah, one of the bypass. best comics, yes. fantastic comic, you know, and and uh, a legendary comedian, really. And and he was another guy that would go to the the factory early before uh, other big names would go. And he was a big name then. He was doing a lot of movies and stuff, and uh, very talented guy. He used to work at Pink's Pink's Hot Dogs back in the day. Oh, did he really? Yeah, he's got some great stories. He's also been on the podcast. Uh, guys, if you're listening, go back and check out my YouTube channel. You'll see some previous interviews with Paul Rodriguez on there and also on iTunes and Spotify. I think he's done it a few times now. But um, yeah, that, that Laugh Factory is like, I, I remember it was one of the first clubs I got in with in the 90s. And it was just, there was something, you know, each club has its own personality, you know. Um, in fact, let's, if, we, if you got a few minutes, let's go club by club and talk about the the Hollywood experience. Like I'll start with the Laugh Factory. What you said, there's the history, but there's it's a very bright club. Like you you just I just feel like it's a bright like spirit there. Like the the colors are orange and yellow. And right when you walk in the lobby, you're seeing the comedy history of like Rodney Dangerfield, Robin Williams. You know, you're seeing Tim Allen. You're seeing like you said Laurel and Hardy. You're seeing Groucho Marx. You're seeing like Phyllis Diller and the magazines that that uh, the Laugh Factory used to have their own magazine and and you're seeing uh in the display case in the front they you see the different merch like the the sweatshirts the hats the t-shirts but also i don't know if you remember this they have laugh factory wrist watches have you seen those well, i have i seen them they, they haven't sold one in 25 years <laughs> my, my go-to joke is uh whenever i see those i go hey jamie if i run the light and uh, do you give me a watch so i can tell time <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I tell you what, those watches. Uh, no, it. Uh, you're right. You know, you mentioned Groucho Marx. Uh, uh, apparently, Groucho Marx had his offices in what is the upstairs portion of the Laugh Factory. Uh, oh. Back in the day, that was uh, Groucho's um, hangout. Is his uh, uh, you know West Coast hangout, and um, he had his offices up there. And so uh, Jamie always says that the Laugh Factory is haunted by uh groucho mark <laughs> if you're gonna have a ghost that would be a pretty cool ghost yeah. to have. you just see yeah. a, you just see a cigar floating around you know <laughs> and a pair of glasses you know ha have you um did you ever spot groucho marks did you ever see him around town you know, I never saw him around town, um, but I was a huge fan. And I still today, during the pandemic, uh, when you're stuck inside so much, I've been watching a lot of those uh, You Bet Your Life, Groucho, uh, you know, the game show where Groucho was uh, was interviewing people. And he was just amazing. Uh, you know, one of the best ever in, in show business. I, he was just I, super funny. I forget her name, but then he had the assistant that uh, kind of gave him a career resurgence later in life. The woman, I forget her name, but... Uh, it's well documented. She was uh, supposedly a little nutty, but got him out there. And there's a lot of things to thank her for that. And other things, it's a little little nutty. I forget her name. Well, I don't know. I don't know exactly who you're talking about, but I know that uh, he was a, he was an amazing talent. And Jamie claims that, and Jamie's got all kinds of weird ghost stories about the Laugh Factory too. Really, like uh, what? He, well, I'll just tell you one. I have no idea, you know, if it's true. But uh, he said that one night uh, he, because uh, he always claimed he could hear Groucho walking around there at night when no one else was there. And uh, one night he shut the place down, turned off all the uh, lights and everything. Uh, and, and, you know, there was back in the day when you had actual candles instead of those kind of electronic candles on the tables now. Yeah. Um, so he had shut everything down, went home. And he went home. And he remembered that he'd forgotten something. So he came back, and this is probably like four in the morning or something. He comes back, he opens the door, and the candles, he said the candles were on the table surrounding in a circle surrounding the stage. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, all lit. And they had not been lit when he left. You know what's weird? I'll tell you one thing that I did. Because I, you know, like uh, the, 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 the front door man, I forget his name right now, the, the big guy, he's real big. Uh, oh, Stevie, Stevie, uh, Stevie. Rubain. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So every time he sees me, he always like, Hey there, and you got your flashlight. You want to go do a ghost check? <laughs> you know, but, um, <laughs> because I'll tell you well, what you happened. Know, they, they, uh, yeah, that yeah. is the rumor. Well, there's, I, 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 you know, listen, this is, I swear, this is, this is what happened. Um, I go up to the, the second floor where there's that bathroom up there. And as I open the door, if you, if you notice when you're in that little tiny bathroom, there's a door directly behind the toilet 
and there's a door behind on the opposite wall. And I think the one on the opposite wall is like where they store like paper towels, etc. But the little door behind the toilet, if it's if it's ever unlocked or open, you'll see that's where they. It, you can actually walk in there. It's uh, it might be like a little passageway or something, and there's you know, like storage in there and alcohol bottles, etc. So when I open the bathroom door, that door, the the door behind the toilet, it was open, and then it shut real quick, almost like someone like knew that I was in there, and they were like, oh, shut the door, and I was like, ooh, I wonder if it's a like somebody sneaking around up here, like because it's a packed Saturday night. So I opened the door and I put my flashlight, and that was the first time that I saw how deep that hallway was behind that. It wasn't just a closet; it's like a little passageway. And then I thought, well, maybe it's when I opened the bathroom door, the suction, the air somehow it made that door slam. But I went downstairs and I told the doorman, I told Steve, I said, "Hey, you should go up there and check around. I don't know if there's someone hiding up there or something." And so it's always been a running joke, but I, I, I swear to you that really did happen when I opened the door, that door was open and then it slammed, bam. Well, you know what? I don't know, uh, you know, how much truth there is to that rumor, but Jamie's been perpetrating that for years, uh, that it is haunted. I, I didn't think um, it was, a, I didn't think in terms of ghost, I thought maybe it was, it was either the suction of the, you know, the air or, or it could be like someone creeping around up there. Well, it could be. And, you know, of course, there's, uh, uh, the comedy store is famous for uh, its uh, ghosts. Everyone seems to know that story. And, um, you know, because that was a place that was... Uh, yeah, let's talk about the comedy. So the Laugh Factory, we, you know, we it's great audiences. It's just they're they're just closing on tight of you. They're, they're just, they're up in the balcony. There's something special about that room. That is a very, very special room in that way that no other club is like that, right? With the balcony. Yeah, the balcony really adds to it. I call it Thunderdome because that's what it feels like when <laughs> yeah. you act. And yeah. it's really a, a really a great club. Like you said, it has a brightness to it and and uh, yeah. and, and and energy, positive energy. I think that comes from the owner. You know, it always comes from the top. And Jamie's just a, a upbeat, fun guy, and I think that's represented in his it, club. It, it could be a little. It could skew sometimes a little younger, like you might. But that's kind of cool though, because sometimes you'll see like a a fancy vehicle out front with a bunch of security. Then you'll go inside and you're like, Whoa, Justin Bieber's here. And that's you know. Bieber. Or, yeah, sure. I saw Rihanna there one time. I actually talked to Rihanna there one time. She was so cool. Oh, what'd she say? She said, get out of my way. <laughs> no, uh, she, she said, uh, she said, can you hand me my was, umbrella? Ella, Ella, Ella. She, she goes, you were funny, boo. You were funny. Oh, that's, that's cool. Maybe she thought you were yeah. a ghost. <laughs> she probably did. Boo. Boo. <laughs> She was booing me. Uh, yeah. So, and land a comedy store down the street, uh, on the strip, uh, about a mile, same side of the street, uh, 8433 sunset. It is, uh, legendary. And of course it was a big nightclub before that. It was a nightclub called Ciro's. And back then, I guess, it, I don't know if it was the management or it was just a headquarters for, mobsters and a lot of and they say that certain people got rubbed out there you know that were in trouble with the mob and so it's got ghosts hanging around i don't know if any of that is true but that's the old stories that you hear and um it's a famous nightclub that a lot of acts played you know if you look at the old posters that they have hanging up on the wall it's like dean martin and jerry lewis and sinatra and all these big acts would play there back in the day and um you know, and then it uh, uh, basically it was uh, Art LeBeau who bought it, the famous radio guy. Uh, Art bought it and was doing shows out of there, doing his radio show out of the uh, where the comedy store is. I, I know Art. Le- then, I know Art LeBeau from the the oldies stuff, right? Like the yeah, low, he's an oldies guy. It was like a yeah. like a lowrider type of vibe. Like his audience was like, "Hey, I want to do a yeah. dedication to Little Spooky." Yeah, exactly. And and he calls it, they call him the, uh, uh, the low rider, uh, Tom Joyner. And he, yeah. um, he takes a low rider from Dallas to Chicago. He does every day <laughs> to do his show, <laughs> you know, but, but he's, uh, you know, he's a cool guy. I know Art. And, uh, he, anyway, he sold it to, um, to Mitzi's husband. And, um, and so, uh, shout out to uh, Sandy, you know, Shore. Sandy Shore. Yeah. yeah. One of the great, one of the great old school comics used to open for Elvis, Paulie Shore's dad, a legendary guy. Anyway, so he had the club, and then when they got a divorce, Mitzi got the club, 
And that's how Mitzi came to be in charge of the uh, comedy store. And, you know, the comedy store is famous for so many big stars coming out of there. Uh, you know, back in the day, the industry would go there to, to scout people. And uh, David Letterman came out of there and, and uh, Jay, uh, Jay Leno and, you know, uh, oh, you know, all the big stars, Roseanne, um, oh, you know, you name it, they came out of that club. And uh, <clears throat> Louis Anderson, who we mentioned earlier, um, I'm just forgetting some of the big names now, but they We're, all all the big names came out of that club. So during that strike, the big famous strike. Pryor, of course, Richard Pryor, yeah, Pryor. And, and were, Robin Williams. You were kind of were you were you doing comedy after the strike, or were you was, did you start during that strike, or or before the strike, or was it? I think even, it was after the strike because I think that's probably why Jamie opened his club down the street was because the, um, yeah, that was what it was. It was, you know, the, the strike, Jamie, I think saw an opportunity. Well, if, if they're not going to have comedy there, I'll open something up down the street. You know, it's funny you say that because I think that's, what's going to happen now. Like with, during the pandemic, I see there's, uh, places that are popping up. There's going to be a new club in Bellflower. I think there's one that's going to open up across from the Haha ha cafe on Lancashire. Um, I'm hearing, you know, people starting you know th th they've learned that they don't need a club to do comedy so people are starting to you know do, i'm seeing shows that are like at outdoor parks that are different you know like legit stuff like where the tickets are you know it's like a, it's not just someone's hey come to my backyard it's like legit like so it'll be interesting what comes up after you know this is over with and things open it will be interesting and i think it does chase uh, change the landscape a little bit um Certainly, and we hope all the the other clubs come back. Yes, uh, and, yes I'm sure. I'm 100%. sure most of them will, but I, let's hope they do. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great clubs in LA, and I think you're right. These this new way of doing shows, these secret shows, and people showing up and doing a show in the park and stuff. That's all good. Rose Bowl parking lot. They're doing a show in the Rose Bowl parking lot. Can you imagine that? It's like, it's a uh, down in Irvine. They're doing it at the parking garage, like upstairs. I don't know if that one will last because yeah. I think they might as well be like, let's just go inside the Irvine Improv. Why do we need to <laughs> play the parking garage? But it's just interesting seeing what they're making work. You know, I did comedy. They called it like comedy in the country, freedom on the farm, and it was uh, a show for about I don't know eighty people out in the, you know, on this this farmer. He had like some property and and they had like a regular stage. They had it was basically like Farm Aid or something like that, but like scaled down but it's interesting seeing like you know what i mean i did one yeah. of those too and it was a little weird because uh i thought i was getting booed and it turned out to be just some cows mooing <laughs> they're like yeah. that joke was bad <laughs> yeah they didn't like my jokes yeah 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 that's funny yeah the comedy store is definitely it's a it's exciting is your name did, did they ever paint your name on the wall they did. They, my name is on the wall. I had to paint it myself, though. Uh, <laughs> I, I, came, I came up there. Yeah, Chingo. I went up there really uh, early in the morning one day and painted it on there. <laughs> They're like, how come the handwriting looks different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I use uh, pink uh, spray paint. You know, you're, but, um, you're a late night guy. I see a lot. Like, well, I see it all the different spots. But uh, back in the late night days, did you ever see, did you used to hang with Sam Kinison or watch him perform? Or <clears throat> I'm sure I knew Sam did. pretty well, yeah. Sam was a great guy, a uh, friend of mine, and, and uh, one of the best comics ever, you know. Um, great guy, you mm. know, and he was he was, comes across like a crazy nut, party-hardy guy, which he was, but he's also very smart. Mm. That was a very intelligent individual. Uh, started out as a preacher, actually. He was a preacher, and then he went into comedy, and um, I got to know him fairly well. He was... Uh, uh, on my radio show quite a bit mm -hmm. and was, uh, in my mind, a genius, you know, um, he got into party partying pretty hard. And I think that may have taken a little bit of the edge off, but, uh, I always have good feelings for Sam. He was a great guy. He was good to people. That's good to know. Um, yeah, no, that, yeah, that comedy store is, uh, now the improv, I'm sorry, the, the laugh factory is compact it has its energy, like you said, Thunderdome Comedy Store. It's beautiful in its way that it has, you know, so many nooks and crannies. And you got the original room, you got the big main room, you got the upstairs belly room. And then, you know, talk about hallways and secret little nooks and crannies and pockets. I mean, there's so many there that it's like, 
it is kind of like a fun house slash haunted house slash you know circus it's yeah it's, great. it's got all that going on and it's also a great hangout because they have that front bar out front and um you know it's a great kind of uh place to just go hang you know um you know, it's, it's your, your bars outside on sunset Boulevard, you know? And so it's cool to hang out there. All the comics love to come and just hang in the hallway kind of too. And I want to do a shout out to Punky Johnson. You know, she uh, was the bartender there in the front bar for years at comedy store. And she's the newest member of Saturday night live. That's amazing. She's so sweet. She's like, every time I yeah, see her smiles up. and you know, I love it when good people get good things. It's just the best. She is really talented, a great person, and uh, it was really nice to see her get that gig. I watch every week now just to see her. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Hollywood yeah. Improv. Let's go over down to the Hollywood Improv. So that's about, what, two miles away? So you got Sunset Strip, and then you have Santa Monica Strip, and then you have Melrose. And Melrose is where the Hollywood Improv is. And they were re they were refurbishing it and, and, and getting it ready a little over a year ago. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen because they added like an upstairs green room for the comics. And then they, they added a whole like spiral staircase. So you could go from upstairs down to the stage. Did you ever see that? Well, I didn't see the spiral staircase, but I do, I do know about the new green room and, um, you know, the, the, it's a leg, another legendary club. It was really, uh, uh, having a heyday at the same time comedy store was, and there was kind of a thing there for a while where you couldn't play both clubs unless you were somebody really good, like Jay Leno or something. You know, most people couldn't play both rooms. But um, I oh, yeah. Missy would Missy would say, <laughs> if you play down there, you can't play here. You know, that's hilarious. And, uh, now that you say that, I remember I used to because I used to work at the comedy store, right? So I'd have my comedy store T-shirt. I remember always making sure that I took it off and put another shirt on when I entered the improv. It's so funny. I yeah, forgot well, all about that. There was a real battle back in the day. Uh, I was lucky because my jokes were so bad that they were going, no, we don't care if you play there or not. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I would go, but I, I've been going there and hosting recently. And, you know, Bud Friedman's an old friend of mine. He is the, the Mitzi Shore of the improv, uh, he, a legendary person. And he also ran the uh, evening at the improv TV show, which was on for many, many years. Uh, and, uh, um, got a, a, a big, big audience and it's a great club, you know, um, and it's, uh, but is, is still a legendary figure. Uh, and, you know, he also had the improv in Vegas at Harris and, uh, the improv in, um, in Tahoe as well. Yeah, I love that Lake and Tahoe improv. The Lake Tahoe room is great. And Bud's a great guy. Uh, did so much for comics, you know, always helping the comics to keep working. Uh, I just have uh, a lot of love for Bud. And, uh, you know, the club is still doing very well. Rita yeah. is running it now. Our friend Rita, you know, she's fantastic. Uh, and uh, Sean Sullivan, uh, formerly from the Ice House, is also part of running that club. And it's just a really uh, page, the booker. It's, it's still a great room. They're so good to us. It's like, and that's a room that it was the, it was the one that it took me the longest to get comfortable on stage. Cause I always had like the other clubs I could get comfortable eventually, you know, as a comic, but that was the last one to make me where I could really be myself because I always had that feeling of like, you never know who's in the crowd here. You never know. And Cause there was a lot of industry that would come well, up to I you afterwards and. You know. Yeah, I think that was the thing. I think it, it, it made people a little uptight that uh, industry was in that club. You're right. So it was a tricky one to get loose in. You know, it took me a long time, too. Um, I think what happens is after you play a club for a while, you just kind of go, you know, screw it. I'm going to be myself. I don't care for <laughs> yeah. what they think, you know. So, so, it, but it, it, you're right. It did have that feeling. And, and maybe because uh, it's lit different. Like it's differently, you know, like, like the Laugh Factory, you know, there's no, you know, you can't really see like other comedians or stars really because they're probably more upstairs in the balcony um comedy store it's dark so you don't really you know you don't really see them Can't see anything but the improv you kind of uh, know like they're right over there there's you know there yeah, i've seen yeah, yeah. i've seen jerry yeah. seinfeld in the audience over there it's like oh you know, yeah no it's crazy man yeah so there's that feeling of like you don't know who's out there and who's going to come up to you and i mean i've i've had gary marshall's assistant like you know, here's our card. Come have lunch. We want to, you know, and it, you just don't know what's going to happen. It's like, you know, I remember one time that they, <laughs> I was, I was standing by the sound booth watching a comic on stage. And then the manager goes, Bud's here. You, you got to clear the hallway. I'm like, Oh, so I look back and there was a chair that was empty. 
and uh, and I asked the person that was sitting behind the chair. I said, "Oh, is anybody sitting here?" And then the person looks up, and it was Jerry Seinfeld. And he goes, "No." <clears throat> and I said, "Oh, do you mind oh. if I sit there?" And he goes, "Go ahead." And I was like, "Oh, wow, that's weird." And I sat down, and then and uh, and I looked. And then Jerry Seinfeld had taken his chair and moved back about 10 spaces. <laughs> well, I'm surprised that uh, Bud didn't charge you for that chair. Exactly. Now, uh, yeah. You know, but no, it's a great place. It's another, you know, beautiful club. Um, another club I like is the uh, Ice House, the legendary Ice House in Pasadena. You know, uh, it's kind of an off-Broadway location, but it has been very... Uh, uh, well loved by all the comedians, all the big comics have played there. They've had a couple of TV shows that have come out of there. As, as you remember, they had the VH1 show hosted by Rosie O'Donnell uh, back when she was doing stand up, and um, and uh, it, that's a, a great club too. Um, K Locos, it, which is a, an English speaking comedy Locos. show on a Spanish network, and if you did it, it was great because they'd air it three or four times that week. And so you get a huge audience. That's I mean, right. I remember going to like the Empire Center in Burbank and getting recognized by like seven people like that day. Like, Well, like, sure. And George Lopez used yeah. to host it. Yeah. And, and uh, that was a great uh, show that came out of that room. Bobby Collins later took over for, um, you know, from uh, Rosie and he hosted our friend Bobby Collins. Uh, it was a, it's a great club. One of the best clubs for comics, as you know, because it has a fantastic acoustics. We're not even sure what that really is. I think there's a low ceiling and, and wooden floors that keep the laughs in the room, but whatever it is, it really has a, a rolling effect when you're, when you're on stage of the crowd, you can just, the last roll back at the, at your, at you and, and you know i've yeah, fantastic I, i've recorded two of my comedy albums at the ice house um that ginger's crazy and stay at home stripper <laughs> those those are the ones i recorded there and i got i got the tonight show from the tonight show talent scouts seeing me at the ice house in pasadena well they used to always go out there and i remember your tonight show appearance you were great man you did the whole thing about the backpack and it was uh, a really good uh, performance on the Tonight Show for you. But yeah, they they used to scout out there. I think it's because it's close to Burbank. So it was before Flappers opened. So it was the closest uh, room to Burbank. And I think they would just shoot out there to see the comics. Yeah. And it's uh, like you said, it's easy to, you know, it's just uh, if you don't want to deal with traffic and you're already in Burbank, you're like, jump on the 210. Boom. You're there in 12 minutes. Flappers is great. I, they got that. That that I don't know if it's five stars, but they got like this five star kitchen with like, and they're always trying new thing. They have specialty of the week, and it's like they got salmon. It's not comedy club food. Like some people, like in Hollywood, um, you might go to like a bar and there's like peanuts and pretzels, and but no, no, Flappers has like a full kitchen, like with a real chef. Yeah, I want to I want to compliment you on making the menu. They have the uh, Darren Carter chimichanga, and uh, it's got a little caricature picture of you in the menu, and it really uh, uh, nice, uh, nice going, buddy. I love it when they do that on the menu, right? Like they like sometimes you'll be on the club for a week, and it'll say like like the party starters, and then it'll have the Darren Carter, and then they have like the drink of the week, and it'll be like usually they would play off of my um, gingerness. They'd be like with ginger this and this and that. And have you ever made the menu at a comedy club that you remember? You know, I never have, except I had to pencil myself in. <laughs> kind of like when I wrote my name on the comedy store yeah. wall. I penciled myself in uh, on a menu, and uh, I had the Fraser Smith curly fries. And uh, <laughs> then, the, then I realized I didn't have curly fries, so it wasn't really a, a good idea. But um, that's the only time I've been on a menu. You know, you get bumped on stage. like That means they take you off because a bigger star comes in. What if they bump you off the menu? They're like, sorry, Fraser, you got to erase you. Steve Hart. Yeah, that's yeah. never good. That's yeah. why I penciled myself in so they could do that. Like Tom Joyner just flew in. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm off the menu then. I'll tell you what though. Uh, the the other thing that I um, see uh, somebody uh, said to me one time. They go, I got Darren's record, uh, Stay at Home Ginger. <laughs> Stay at Home Ginger. Yeah, yeah, they they combined your two uh, albums. Yeah. 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 Uh, for those listening at home, my first album is called Shady Side. Shady Side. And then the, the fourth album is called The Party Continues. The yeah, Party. you have some really good albums, man. Those are cool. And they're always they're out there if you guys want to buy them or listen Which to them. Which is the on one Spotify. that has the Halloween stuff on it? That one is I think that one is the um the uh, stay at home stripper, I think. 
That would, it's yeah, really, yeah. That's some really good stuff. We used to play it on the, our radio show every year. We played a lot of your stuff, but that's cool. That was Thank a favorite. You. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good one, it. right? Like the Halloween stuff yeah. and the pumpkin patch. Great. And- <laughs> great stuff. That's I want to get more great stuff like that because I love having um, – isn't it great to have, like, good material? Like, you know, you're like – I wouldn't know. <laughs> now, you know <laughs> – You have great material. Do you, let me ask you this. Uh, like, like for the people, if you haven't heard Fraser, he's awesome. He's doing some self-deprecating stuff now. But I'll set him up and uh, just uh, let, let's say this is it's the summertime. Hey, uh, or whatever. Like, you're sweating. Hey, Fraser, are you are you hot in here? Are you sweating? You know, I, it is pretty hot in here. I was sweating like Gavin Newsom watching Total Recall. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Come on, folks. You know, uh, I was watching uh, the, the Capitol Hill's uh, riot was crazy, wasn't it, Darren? Yeah, it was Capitol it was Hill cuckoo. riot. Yeah. When I first turned on the news, I thought they were raiding a Jake Paul after party. <laughs> That's right. You know, a lot of people are saying they think that they faked the Mars landing. Well, oh, come on. You got to admit, it does look like Palmdale. I swear I saw a meth lab. <laughs> you, you saw a cholo pop out, boo, fucker. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, the Dr. Seuss is in trouble for they're pulling the books because of uh, racist content. Uh, and and they, they may be right because I read one of the poems. It was a little weird. It said, I hate green, green eggs and ham and people of color. <laughs> Dang, I never saw that one. Yeah, that was, <laughs> was for the, unab- uh, the unabridged version. You know, Darren, they should have had Domino's deliver the vaccine. We would have had it in a half hour with cheesy bread. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, I just watched an interview with the woman who had Gorilla Glue in her hair. I don't know. She seemed kind of stuck up. Hey, I like that. That's good. Uh, hey, if you, you know, Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre is recovering from an aneurysm. Uh, I'm sure it had nothing to do with his ex-wife asking for $2 million a month alimony. <laughs> Two million a month. How much is he paying the pool boy? <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. You know, and and you know the pandemic causes a lot of problems. You know, back in the day when you would sneeze, people would yell, "Bless you." <laughs> now, when you sneeze, people whisper, "Fuck you." <laughs> that's true. Like, Fuck yeah. You. Hey, Gorilla Glue, and then you could do the different types of glues. Like in the country, they use Elmer's glue. You know, Tom Joyner, he uses airplane glue. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the economy is still bad because of this thing, too. You know, Darren, the, the whole uh, pandemic thing has caused a lot of problems with the economy. So bad. Dr. Fauci's now wearing two ma- one mask. I screwed that up. He's That's wearing okay. one mask. Take two. Take two. Hey, how bad is the economy now? So bad that Dr. Fauci's wearing one mask. <laughs> That's good. How about the uh, yeah, mic? So bad that, uh, it's so bad that uh, Ted Cruz is now vacationing in Tijuana. <laughs> no more Cancun? <laughs> Yeah, you know we have we have indoor dining again, uh, Darren. Uh, I can't wait to get uh, an indoor lap dance. <laughs> That's what I'm waiting. You're for, like enough buddy. of this parking lot stuff. I don't even know. If, was that a real stripper? <laughs> <laughs> it was a ginger. It was a ginger stripper. Hey, you could be uh, like, uh, hey, the economy's so bad. Mike Lindell is now selling your pillow. <laughs> <laughs> you know the my pillow guy. You know he just broke up with his girlfriend. Yeah, apparently it, it didn't end well. They wound up in a big pillow fight. <laughs> All right, oh, the crowd oh, loved oh, it. Oh, I have a drum roll. Can you hear the drum roll? Listen. Can you hear that? <laughs> yeah, I like Here, that. Let me Very turn good. it up. I'll make it a little bit louder. Folks, good night, everybody. Yeah, hey, give me a quick little joke so I can hit this drum roll. If you okay, got one. hold on a second. Let me see what we got here. I got to see. You know, you do all these one-liners. A, a, a listener wrote in yesterday when I said that you're going to be on. They said, hey, he's from the 80s. When it came to cocaine, how many lines did he do? One? I didn't really get the joke, but one-liners or something? Oh, one line. Oh, I got you. Oh, I like, got you. Well, here's one. This is a little crude, but I, you know, uh, they have the new anal swab. Yeah, I tried it. They didn't find shit. <laughs> Folks, come on. Dude, dude that, that rim shot worked. They didn't find shit. <laughs> oh my gosh, come on. I gotta bring that with me, man. I know. <laughs> you know, the one thing good thing about the uh, uh pandemic is that my dealer now has curbside service. Yeah, you you can get a contactless high. <laughs> Folks. Dude, these this drum roll thing is good. I, I got to take that with me. You got a lot of great jokes. Damn, you got a lot of great jokes. You I know, mean, the election uh, was really uh, nerve wracking, wasn't it? It was like waiting for your colonoscopy results. <laughs> hey, folks. <laughs>
So, uh, yeah, you know, now where we were, we were talking about the clubs. Um, yeah. Hey, isn't there like a, don't you have a joke about, or a story about uh, a guy with five penises or something? Guy with five penises. Um, How does pants fit? Oh, yeah. What was that joke? I can't remember that joke. Something about five penises. How do your pants fit? Like a glove. Like a glove. That was the old yes. Wasn't there another one about about a... Oh, I don't want to give away the punchline, but uh, I'll forget it. Something about fire extinguisher. God, I can't remember that one either. How about I'm your sister? Jokes. How about your sister and the and the uh, the vegetarian sister at Thanksgiving? Well, you know, she <laughs> she wanted to get a tof uh, tofurkey, and so I told her to tofurk herself. <laughs> okay, enough Good of night. the drum roll. This is just now. It's like it's gone from hilarious to just torture. Where I'm like, come on, yeah. Fraser, go through your notebooks, dust them off. Well, just, Let's start yeah. with 1979, the first year you. I can't remember the fire extinguisher joke. What was that? No, joke? something about a like a like a vibrator or a dildo or something. Or that was. Ah. And she's like, that's a that's a fire extinguisher or something. How Maybe. do your five? How do your pants fit? Um, <laughs> like a glove. <clears throat> like a glove, folks. Come on. <laughs> I've seen you like whip people up into a frenzy where they can't breathe, man. When you when you're doing those jokes, like, and they're just one after another, it's like bam, 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 bam. It's like, oh my gosh, like just standing ovation. Like they're just like, it's a, it's incredible to see. You know, it's uh, you know what I mean. Well, when you the got whole them against thing with the that ropes, style, yeah, yeah, is is that you try to um, just keep them coming because not all the jokes are great, but what you want to do is keep the, the role going. There's a, there's kind of a momentum to that style. You know, the greatest guy for that was Bob Hope. Bob Hope was, uh, you know, legendary for that. And, uh, you know, he would do the jokes just one after another, like a machine gun. And so, so did Rodney Dangerfield, same thing. He was a one liner guy and just had a million of them. You know, they, the old thing where they go, he's got a million of them. Well, he really did. Rodney yeah. had a million. I got to meet Rodney uh, and, and I got to know him. Yeah. He would come into Laugh Factory every Friday night for a while when he was probably in his 80s and I was hosting and he would do 15 minutes. I would bring him up on stage. Hey, kid. OK. Hey, I like those jokes. All right. Did you write those? OK, kid. So he'd go up on stage. He'd do 15 minutes. They'd give him a standing O when he first got up and then uh, he would kind of you know, fumble through his set and uh, they give him a standing O when he left. And uh, when I say fumble through, he was usually trying new material and he couldn't remember it half the time. So uh, it was kind of a little choppy. And then I remember he got a gig uh, at a radio convention and Jamie and I were there from Laugh Factory. Uh, and in fact, Jamie, I think, booked him on the show and he had to do 45 minutes and they were paying him $50,000 to do 45 minutes at this thing. And I thought, man, he's not going to get through it. He can't get, even get through 15 minutes. He got up on stage. He looked like a whole different guy. He had on a his blue suit and his red tie, and he just killed. And he, wow. he he just did one joke after another, just bam, bam, bam. And and you're you're standing in the back, just stunned. You know, it's like wow. When they pay the guy, he comes through. You know, <laughs> that's a great lesson, right? Like I I only met yeah. him once, and it was uh, what you just described. It was late night, probably on a Monday, Laugh Factory in the '90s, and. You know, he might have been wearing the robe. He might have been, I don't remember. But I do remember him having reading glasses, kind of looking disheveled, having a little note cards up there. And just kind of like the, the glasses were, I'm picturing them on the end of the nose going, okay, I went to the doctor. He said, blah, 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 blah. Hey, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I, my wife um, bought a broom and I said, hey, you know. And it, like you said, it was, it was, they were standing ovation, excited to see him. But, um, yeah, you know what I mean? It was like, I was like, wow, because I, I was not at that level at all. I was at the level of, like, like me, I'm needy, please, I'm just, I'm new to L.A., like that kind of, as opposed to the relaxed veteran. <laughs> yes, you're very relaxed now. Well, you know, uh, you do get that with stage time, and I think that um, those old guys, you know, they started the same way that, that we all started. Uh, I was watching an interview with Carson, or was it with Carson? Um trying to think with Rodney and he was talking about, oh, it was with Howard Stern and he was talking about how he got uh, started. And back in his day, there weren't many clubs. So you had to, he said, well, I had to play some really tough joints. Okay. Uh, you know, and, uh, and one club, they, their specialty was the broken leg of lamb. Um, and uh, he said, he, you know, he would he'd go in there and he goes, if you didn't do good, they wanted to beat you up, <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, so, you know, he had a tough start. And at one point he stopped, doing stand up 
and uh, was selling aluminum siding because it was during the era when, you know, people were buying aluminum siding for their homes. Um, and uh, so a bunch of the comics did that apparently, you know, and so he, she kind of stopped show business. He was out there, you know, schlepping the, uh, Aluminum siding. I think, and, his, I think uh, he's he going by the name Jack Roy. I think that was his real name, Jack right? Roy. Something like that? Yeah. Or? Yeah. And then he would do the Ed Sullivan show occasionally. And then his customers would say, hey, aren't you the guy I saw on Ed Sullivan? <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it was, he was a little embarrassed by that. But he said Ed Sullivan was cool. And he would mention that, uh, hey, if you want some aluminum siding, uh, check out Rodney's and you know, give out his address, you know, or his phone number. Mm-hmm. Um so those were the back in the day. Did you ever meet Pat Cooper? Never met Pat Cooper, but I was a fan. I know. He, he uh, I heard him on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast and he's really funny. And of course I used to hear him on the radio and stuff, but he 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 was great, man. I uh I think he's still alive, isn't he? I think he's in his 90s. Possibly. Uh I used to hear him on Stern and he was a really a great uh, comedian. Yeah, he's great. But um, man, you're a great comedian and a great radio. Let's talk before you go. Let's talk about a couple of current events. Uh, you know, uh, that Jake Paul Ben Askren fight is coming up. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, it's funny. I met Jake Paul. He at the Laugh Factory. He was mm-hmm. in the front row uh, late one Friday night, and I pointed him out, and I had everybody, you know, clap for him and stuff. And he's he's a cool kid. I tell you, I really. Uh, I think that uh, he and his brother are doing an amazing job in the sense of, I think they're pretty good boxers. You know, I don't know if they can, how far up they can go. I don't know if they could take on the top boxers, but they could take on the middle range guys. They're pretty, pretty good fighters. They, and, and they, um, they're really good promoters. You know, these YouTube oh, kids are, yeah. are amazing. And I watched a clip of his fight against Nate Thurman, you know, the, uh, or Nate Robinson, the, um, uh, basketball player, and uh, it was sold out. The, the Staples Center sold out, packed, you know, 15,000 people. So these guys know how to fill a place. Uh, you know, they, they know how to promote. And, uh, you know, I think they can beat a lot of guys. You know, they, they Ben Askren is a very talented wrestler. You know, he's a great wrestler, uh, world champion. But his boxing, you know, uh, striking really isn't his thing. So, you know, I yeah, think probably I, Jake Paul, Jake Paul probably has the edge in that one. I, um, you know, I think he'll probably beat him because I think Ben's really, if it was wrestling, Ben would easily win, you know, but I think yeah. Jake Paul could win that. I, I was watching some clips this morning and, you know, Jake Paul, I think he's like two and oh, as a professional boxer. He's, I think he's 23 years old. I read young, he's powerful. He's explosive. Like his punches are like explosive, like fast. Um, and uh, I know someone that does that reporting, ES News, Ellie Sackback reporting, and he's been in the boxing gym with them, and he said he's legit, like he's a good boxer. And, you know, and then, of course, people go after Ellie. They're like, you're just saying that. But but still, I mean, the guy, he's good at trolling to get eyeballs on him for the event, and he's he's pretty good, you know, I got to be honest. And then when you look at Ben Askren. I think he is pretty good. I think, you know, he's got a big punch. I was watching the Ben Askren clips today, and and I don't know how old he is, but he definitely his fast twitch muscles. He remind me of myself. He looked a little bit like pretty slow. He looked slow and not a, like a good boxer. Like I'm like, wow, that looks like probably what I would be looking like, you know. But and he's probably and obviously he's, Ben Askren's even better than me. But he didn't really do any footwork. He just kind of stands there and like punches like a stiff like, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> and then. For his UFC he actually fight, he makes that sound, and that's the scary part. <laughs> yeah, dick, 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 dick. yeah, and yeah. for like his UFC fights, he would do like this spinning back fist, which you can't do in boxing, and uh, you know, and it looked even that looked kind of slow. And then his hammer, I don't know, he just looks kind of slow and not explosive. I, <clears throat> I hope it's going to be better well, than that, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think he's going to. I asked uh, our buddy Adam Hunter last night. I said, "What do you, who do you think is going to win?" He said, "Ben Askren is going to get knocked out." Well, I think he's probably right because, uh, uh, you know, and, and Adam's a fighter and, and he really knows that scene, you know. Uh, but I do think he's right. I think Ben's just a little too um, unskilled in the boxing end of it, you know. he Again, if it, was, if it was a wrestling match, Ben would win. But I think for a boxing match, I think Jake Paul's probably going to win it. Um, and then Logan Paul, his brother, is supposed to uh, fight uh, Floyd Mayweather. 
in an exhibition? Mm-hmm. I don't know on that one. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. I think uh, Mayweather pretty much carried Conor McGregor in their fight. You know, I mean, it was they said Conor did okay, but I don't know. I think. I think he really carried him. I think Conor McGregor would kill him in a boxing, and I mean, an MMA fight. But you know, yeah. when it's regular boxing, a Floyd's one of the best ever. So I just think uh, the good news for the for the Paul brothers, though, is that they're great promoters and they get a buzz going, and that's good for all of boxing and MMA because they're getting eyeballs, and and that's yeah. really it's a business, you know. And and uh, so my hats off to the guys for that. Do you, um, any idea like what their weights are? Are they similar weights or is Jake Paul a lot bigger? He seems like he's a lot bigger. I think the brothers are similar, but I think that, um, I wonder what Jake, I could Google it. You know what? Let me see if I can Google it. I'm guessing Jake Paul's probably 195, something like that. Maybe looks like he's one, 190. Maybe, um, let me see. I'm going to look up Jake Paul. That makes him a lot bigger than Floyd Mayweather. Floyd's, you know, um, uh, 140. Let me see here. Uh, oh, your phone, uh, your phone um, signal got a little bad. If you moved around, Jake Paul. Hello, 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 Jake Paul. Wait, here we go. Um, six one, and oh, one sixty five. No, that's kilograms. Oh gosh. Oh, one hundred sixty five pounds. No, oh. he's bigger than that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's that's crazy. Uh, that's maybe from a couple years ago. Yeah. Okay. Here's one. Here's one. Um, Jake Paul seemingly enjoys a slight size advantage over Ben Askren. However, the most intriguing aspect of his apparent size advantage is that it is too, isn't too sizable. The combat sports community is currently abuzz with debates and discussion regarding the YouTube megastar Jake Paul and retired MMA star Ben Askren. Paul 2-0, 2-0 is set to face Askren. Zero zero, who's never had a professional boxing fight, uh, April seventeenth, twenty twenty one. Perhaps one of the biggest misconceptions regarding this matchup, which has lately spread across the combat sports world, is that of Ben Askren being at a significant size disadvantage. Jake Paul is six one, with a seventy six inch reach. On the other hand, according to UFC.com, Ben Askren is five eleven, with a seventy two inch reach. They don't say anything about weight. Way to go. I know, right? Uh, Come on, guys. Come on. I know. Why don't they say the weight? Well, I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, and I, I, I think Jake Paul probably takes this one. I know, and then you were saying that the uh, the promotion team behind them is like a. It's kind of a newer. Is it it called Triller? Trilla. Trilla. And uh, yeah, I think they work with Trilla. They are really putting a lot of money out for bouts. And I think it's really catching the attention of the, uh, of the fighters because um, they're offering some pretty big purses for this stuff. And uh, you know, so they're changing the landscape. It's like you say, the comedy landscape is changing. So is the uh, combat sports landscape, man. Imagine if you had like a side job somehow in the boxing world, because you know, you're a comedian, you're a radio announcer, you know, about boxing, you, you train for like, Eight years? Yeah, and I and I never actually had a fight. But, you know, um, <laughs> it was a lot of training. By the time I started, I was, I was 190 pounds. By the time I was done, I was 112 because I lost a lot of weight training. <laughs> yeah, what if you just train and then by the time you're ready, you're too old. You're like, you know, I started this gym when I was 24. And now I'm finally <laughs> ready 90. and I'm 56 and I'm ready. <laughs> you're 90. Yeah, you're like, yeah. I'm, I'm finally ready, coach. Yeah. You're fighting incontinence at that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Folks, where's the rim shot? Come on, Darren. Oh, shoot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Dang, I was slow on that. See, I'm not explosive. I'm slow like Come ben on, Askren, man. You're like Ben Askren. I know. Where's the drum machine? <laughs> there you go, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I've I've been having a ball. Uh, you know, so I got the boxing gym I go to in uh burbank not in burbank but in la shout out to blue moon boxing shout out to blue moon boxing they're great man great coaches great great people excuse me i have a gerald washington you know he's a heavyweight boxer he fought deontay wilder at one point he was in the top ranked in the top 10 you know uh so i have these guys that are like legit boxers you know every now and then they'll stop what they're doing or at the end of their workout they'll give me some tips and 
you know, last week or the week before, Gerald was giving me some pointers. He was like, he was like, I want you to practice your combos, man, your, your combos. So the combo, for those that aren't, you know, familiar with that, meaning throw like a, a jab. So I throw a jab and then he's like, okay, you need to practice moving. So jab, move, like move out of the way. You don't want to be a standstill target. So jab, move. Now double jab, pop, pop, move. Now do a double jab, right hand. So it's double jab, right hand, move, and then jab in between. And then a jab, a right hand, a left hook, move, and then double jab. Boom, boom. That's well, the other thing they say, sometimes you're moving so fast you combine them. It's like a, a jab, move becomes jube. Jube. Do a jube. 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 Oh, jube. really? Jube, jube. 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 All, jube. With all a I, v. I felt like a, like a, you know, when you first learn to tie your shoe, you have to, so like, I would be like, jab. And then I'm trying to think, what do I do next? Oh, yeah, jab. He's like, you got to move, man. Move, move. So. You know, these guys. See, look- I would stop and tie my shoe in the middle of the bout. That <laughs> exactly. wasn't a good idea. I, you jab, do a timeout. Timeout, please. Jab, jab, timeout. Yeah, that's a kneeling eight. <laughs> yeah, kneeling Folks, eight. come on. But anyway, so Go like. Ahead. It's uh, it's interesting to to practice because all that like it's one thing to memorize the punches, but then you have to remember to move in between, like actually step to the left, step to the right, just all that stuff, you know. Um, but that'd be imagine if you did like get some job in the uh, the boxing world, isn't it? It's Fraser Smith. You know, I don't know. I think I did some ring announcing one time. Did you? That was yeah, I did one of those. That was interesting. What, was that like announcing the fighters on the way to the ring? No, inside the ring, you know, you're in the ring, you know, kind of like uh, Jimmy uh, or Michael Buffer. Oh, wow. Was that something you'd want to do again? You know, I no. <laughs> <laughs> really? What was it? No, about? It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. I didn't mind it, but it was fun. But, um, you know, you, 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 there's certain technical things you can't do. You can't give away the scores. You can't, uh, you have to tease one score and tease the other score and then finally give it away. You can't give it away too early. You know, you can't just say so and so won. You oh, know, so you got, oh, you had to do the announcements after the fight, so you'd be like, well, both, and the oh. be, the same guy does the open and the close. So you'd be the score, whatever, like one ten to one oh seven. Yeah, that's how you do it. You don't say the name. Oh, did you mess up? Maybe. The yeah, first I time. did. Then they got mad at me. Uh, but it was, <laughs> you know, it's, it, there's an art to that. <laughs> how did you do it? Mike Tyson I wins. I just, or just, yeah. yeah, I think I did something like that. But Jimmy Lennon Jr. is a friend of mine, and he's one of the best ever at that. Oh, wow. See, yeah. I, was, when I knew Senior, too. I knew his dad. When, when I'm in that boxing gym, sometimes I think, I wonder what kind of, what I would do in this business, like a, as a side fun thing. I don't know what it would be. Maybe, the, but yeah, that sounds kind of hard to do what you just said. Even announcing is hard because you really, uh, you know, it's it's hard. You know, we're fans and we love to watch it, but um, to actually say, you know, like a lot of times I'll think it's a, a right cross, but it's a left hook. You know, I'm just completely. Oh no, I couldn't wrong. do that. That's that's. I don't even know. I've seen people get knocked out, and I have to go back and look. Like, how do they even do that? And then I know the, I'm a step or two behind. You know, and that's just watching it. Yeah, and they're you like know, uh, shovel hook or whatever. I'm like, well, well, how well, do you uh, even? Yeah. I'm good friends with Joe Goosen, and Joe is a, not only a world-class trainer, he trained a lot of uh, world champions, he's also an announcer, TV announcer. And we'd be watching a fight, you know, and, at his house or something, and I go, man, that was a great left hook. And he goes, no, that was a right hand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he, he sees everything, and I see nothing. I'm usually way behind and wrong. I asked a boxer once, I said, what? I go, it's so confusing, it happens so fast. He, his tip to me is, is whenever you watch a boxer, just watch one. Don't look at both because it's going to be confusing. But just look at, just focus on one and see what they're doing, like their defense, their offense. Because when you look at both, you're you're all over the place. See, I did that once, and it turns out it was just one guy shadow boxing. <laughs> it wasn't good. There we go, Frazier. Oh, thank, thanks for coming on the show. It's always good to have you, and uh, you know I appreciate you, you you stopping what you're doing and coming on and hitting us with those jokes with the history of the comedy club in Hollywood. And next time we'll expand to more topics and stories and just, gosh, man, thank you so much. Always love coming on your show, Darren. You always have a great show. You're a great comedian and, and thanks for having me on. I have to get going. I have a lunch with Tom Joyner. Uh, I, I can't remember if it's in Dallas or Chicago, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> everybody. We're done with this interview. Love Thanks, you, Fraser. Dude. Have a great day, buddy. Thank you. You too, buddy. Thank okay. you. I'm out. He's out. There we go. 
Wow, guys, how great was that? The great Fraser Smith. If you enjoyed this program, please do me a favor. Share it with somebody. Share the YouTube link. If I put it on YouTube, share it on iTunes, Spotify, and hit that notification so you'll know whenever there's a new podcast coming up. You'll know. You'll be the first to know. Uh, Give it a review. Give it five stars. Say a little something. Help those algorithms. If you want to help out, uh, if you want to donate to the program, because every every little bit helps. I swear to you, it does. DarrenCarter.com on PayPal or Venmo. It's at Darren Carter comic on Venmo at Darren Carter comic on Venmo. Okay. Enough of the plugs. You guys are great. Thanks for being here with me. And uh, remember, don't hurt nobody. Be careful.